Welcome to another episode of Board Game with Education. Today, I'm joined by William Brown from The Hungry Gamer. Check out his YouTube channel. He does different board game reviews. He covers a lot of really cool games. Check it out, I'll leave a link below. But today, we have him on the show to talk about the games he's used in his classroom. We specifically talk about this vampire game where he took the mechanic from this game and use parts of the game to teach writing. So really excited to share some of these tips and insights with you. So let's get into today's episode. Game with Education is a online community and web store. We carry different board games from several different publishers, and we also specialize in carrying games for learning. So we have some science-based games, some math-based games, and some of our games also come with additional supplemental learning materials to help you with using different tabletop games in your learning environment. So check out our web store at boardgamewitheducation.com. And also thank you for checking out the channel and watching this interview. It goes a long way by liking and commenting below on the video. It really helps YouTube's algorithm. We're a new channel. We can use any help we can get with the algorithm. Uh, with the algorithm. So again, thank you for being here and let's get into the chat with William. All right, so welcome to another episode of Board Game with Education. Excited to be joined by William Brown today from Hungry Gamer. And we are talking about board games in the classroom, so or tabletop games in the classroom. I guess we'll talk about what, what those things mean, why we use either term. Um, so you are a sixth grade ELA teacher, and you do board game reviews. So you kind of seen your worlds collide, and you're using some tabletop games in the classroom. Um, before we talk about that, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit more? Yes. Uh, so thanks for having me on. And hello, all the thousands of people that are watching live, I'm sure. <laughs> someday. Um, yeah, so someday, they've had thousands of, uh, of people who are thinking about watching someday. Hello. Uh, so yes, uh, I teach sixth grade language arts. I teach two sections of literature. And we read several books. We read a shortened odyssey. We read the Hobbit, we read Julius Caesar and Tale of Two Cities, and then also all of the grammar and composition as well to those students. And then I run the student council for them as well. Um, outside of teaching, I also run a theater company called Perspective Theater Company here in the Bay Area. We do uh, Shakespeare and then a non-Shakespeare after we do a Shakespeare every time. So we do that as well, which is based off of theater, but either taking Shakespeare and viewing it from a different perspective, preferably a, a voice that is not given the spotlight as much. I don't like to say given the spotlight because that means that's very much, let me give you a thing, mm. but kind of, kind of that, that idea. And then of course, I also do the Run Hungry Gamer. So I write reviews. I do video reviews and previews and playthroughs and unboxings and how to play videos and everything except for live streaming. So anything you want, board game content related, I do it. And uh, you can easily find that on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. That's awesome. You're a busy man. Do you have I try. <laughs> you know, and everyone problem? comes to the channel just because they can see the uh, the board game dog. Beatrice, the board oh, game dog yeah. is the most <laughs> popular thing I do. <laughs> it's like um, those Reddit subreddit, the, the animal subreddit always comes to the front page because everybody loves the pets. <laughs> Yeah, you know the only thing I actually follow on Instagram outside of some some friends or other board game stuff is uh, we rate dogs. That's okay. it. Yeah, <laughs> that is the best thing. That's it. Yeah. That's funny. Cool. All right, so let's let's jump into the topic. And uh, like I mentioned before, coming on, I really want to try to broaden our approach with introducing more people to tabletop games and even more specifically how we can use them for learning and in the classroom. So, could you tell us what is it? tabletop game and kind of like what that means using it in class so so when you dropped this question on me i was like ah oh god what is the difference between a board game and a tabletop game <laughs> yeah. and and truth be told i would say it's having a board i guess is the difference between those two but the idea of a, of a tabletop game is it's where you're in my mind you're, you're meeting around a table and you are playing a game with components on the table. Now, I, I hesitate to say it's non-digital because the digital world and the board game world are very much kind of meshing and coming together. There's a lot of games now that are using using digital uh, apps to, to help play the game or give you all the narrative and so on and so forth. But for me, it is playing a game around the table. 
together where you're looking at each other, you're talking to each other, and then probably rolling dice or playing cards or something like that. Though I would also say uh, role-playing games like your Dungeons and Dragons and all of those different variants, that also falls into tabletop game. It's just a different a different beast than the type of thing that uh, uh, I'm that, that I use in class that I'm talking about. Right. And it's, yeah, I, I started thinking about this because of just, I think for an aside, it's like marketing for me. It's like, what word do I use? Do I use board games or use tabletop games? And like, we use them both to say the same thing usually. Right. But if, we, if you drill down into it, we can say, yeah, like you mentioned, the board is the difference technically as a technicality. Cool. So what, what does it mean? Oh, and just kind that? of the echo does, I think about it, I think in some ways using the term tabletop game, is possibly more useful for a wider audience because most people who aren't into the hobby like we are would think of Monopoly, the game of life, shoots and ladders, Parcheesi, sorry, those kinds of games, which is not to say that they aren't board games or they're not tabletop games. But I think what we're starting to talk about and some of the games that we're going to talk about today are so much beyond that style of game in terms of what's what's happening. And so it's kind of a different world that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So perhaps tabletop games is a better term. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've started using that term more when I think about it. Um, I, I mean, we're board game with education. I use that to kind of, you know, use that term board game that everybody's familiar with and then to reel them in to introduce them to other awesome games. So what does it mean to like, what does it look like from a, large, broader perspective using a tabletop game in class? Well, it, it's really evolved for me the past couple of years, and it really came along with the starting of doing the, the reviews is really what started to, to shift it uh, for me. So it started out with, I would pull out a game for students every now and then just as a reward, you know, on a Friday when they'd been well behaved that week. We were done with our work. Oh, we'll play some kind of a game. And then I started getting a little more into the hobby. And then I started a, just a board game club. And it was, again, it was used not necessarily to advance their education in class, but as a, well, the carrot, it was, I would meet once a month at lunchtime. I'd bring in something quick and simple, like a castle panic or some, something like that, that we could play over the course of lunch. Right. And I would limit it to four or five students. And I'd set up a game in itself where it was to be allowed to come play. You've got to jump through these hoops. One, can't have any homework outstanding in any of your classes. That's mm -hmm. number one. And then it would be something they had to do. So when we played code names, they had to make up their own code and write me a message in their code and include the cipher that said, I want to come do board game club and put it into the oh. hidden folder I had somewhere in the classroom. But it was all really a reward and a way to get them to do what they were supposed to be doing anyway, kind of that extra yeah. carrot, you know, and that's where it started. But then as I started doing reviews, what started happening was I got a couple of games that I needed 10 plus people to play. I'm like, what? I, I don't have 10 friends. I'm lucky yeah. to have three friends, right? I mean, we're, we're, you get older. It's hard to have 10 friends. <laughs> And so then I took one of them into the classroom. I said, well, we got something to do. Let's try it. And they were just so excited to be trying these things. And then as you get more into these hobby games, the connections you can make to learning is shockingly easy to make connections. And so it started out, I would start bringing in games like um, Two Rooms and a Boom, which because we try to teach uh, uh, soft skills and the idea of you know, working together and communicating and then kind of reading cues and being able to read body language and all these kinds of things. And I was trying to review two rooms in a boom, which for my students, it's a glitter bomb. It's a glitter bomb that's going to go off, okay. which for me is worse. Like, just give me, <laughs> just, just real bomb me, please. I don't yeah. need the glitter. But they were so into it and they started talking to each other. And kids that they never talked to, they start mm. communicating with. They were so excited about it. And then that led into some puzzle games I started taking. The very first game I reviewed on the channel is a game called Dr. Esker's Notebook. 
which is a single deck of cards and it's just puzzles. And you've got to figure out how to manipulate the cards. And I would put those up on the screen with the document camera and I explained the rules and I had gone through and solved the puzzle that they're going to do. So if they really needed clues, I could give them to them. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's about critical thinking. And again, working together, because then I would assign a student that baby isn't the most confident. I'd say, okay, you're the one who's in charge of calling on people and you're the one who's in charge of manipulating the cards because it's a game where you have to, if you manipulate the cards right on someone, like suddenly, oh, you see the path or, you know, whatever it is. And it just has slowly been evolving from there on and on and on. It's where now one of the other teachers will play just one with her students in history class but it's not just one where for those who don't know, just one's a game where you're all working together and you have a word that mm. everyone's trying to make someone guess. And so if the word is burrito. Everyone else around the table knows that's the word. And they're going to write down one word that's going to make Dustin and I or Dustin guess burrito. But if anybody has the same word, they get erased. So if two of us put tortilla, then tortilla gets erased. So that makes people start putting down like, you know, they think, oh, well, well, beans or maybe someone or, or salsa or meat or whatever it is. And so then he sees all the words that are left and tries to guess burrito. But now that's being done in history class. Yeah. So there's you know, John Locke and they have to come up with single words to make them guess John Locke. And so now suddenly these games are starting to build up and grow these and get them excited about learning in a way that's just different and it engages a different part of the brain. And we're going to talk later about the big project I did all year with a game called thousand year old vampire, but I've been going on for a minute, but we'll, no, we'll no. come back to that. Yeah. I love the, just one example because it makes me realize too, there's those moments you mentioned John Locke, just going off your example. I, I don't know. I mean, I remember reading about him back in the day, so I don't know if I can remember some stuff, but he was very important when you were in middle school. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I studied a little bit about him in university too for, for uh, philosophy. Well, yeah, it's kind of one of those things like, you know, it could be Thomas Jefferson, you know, independence, Monticello, slaves. I mean, you can pick all these different words. Uh, Hamilton, you could, you know, mm. someone they might say Hamilton because of the, the musical. And so just all these things, but now they're bringing in their knowledge. What's interesting to them about whoever it is that they're learning and in the case of Jefferson, then you like pop culture. And so it's just really starting to, we, we like to talk about uh, whole brain learning. I don't know if you use that in your classrooms, but it's more than just this memorization and regurgitation, which is why that's uh, I wish I did it in my class. I, it's a history class thing, but it's just, yeah. it, it works. Yeah. And like you have those, you gave the example of Thomas Jefferson and there might be a moment in that game where there's a particular fun moment that comes up and you'll never forget that experience playing that game that's tied to learning that you're doing in class too. Um, yeah, I played it just just played just one with them the other day because it was been a particularly hard week of testing and whatever it was. And the word violin came up and they just laughed so hard because the clue that because they everything was getting erased because everyone was saying the same thing strings or you know, except for the one kid uh, only one person put music, which was amazing. And then one, someone said a student that doesn't even go to the school anymore, who was apparently a violin virtuoso. And they just laughed and thought that was the greatest thing. And I had, I looked, I was, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but Hey, hey you got it. Good job. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, so before we go into maybe sharing a little bit about like your major project, what are, what have been some other benefits and maybe then we can go into some challenges with using tabletop games. Yeah, so I think the biggest benefit outside of the, the larger project that we're going to talk about has just been getting the students to break out of their clicks, their groups, because to succeed in the types of games that I, uh, that I bring out for them, they have to communicate. And they have to communicate with different students that they might not normally. And then they all have to, at some point, take center stage, which mm. for some kids is very challenging. But it's a safe way for them to be in the spotlight because it is literally a game. 
And right. it's not even like they're playing basketball where there's a you know, a loss and people are there and it's a big deal. No, it's we're playing a game in the last 20 minutes of class or mm. whatever it may be. And so it's a confidence builder and it's a way for students who, I want to say, learn differently where they have just, they're, they're, they just connect with things in a different way rather than the traditional lecture and worksheets and testing. It's a way for them to suddenly shine a little bit because usually the kids who are excellent at a lot of these games are not the ones that are excellent at everything else. And I don't know if, if anybody's just listening, I'm doing the air quotes on excellent, mm, you right. know, but it's usually someone that they get an opportunity to, to shine in a different way. Um, and so for me, that that's the biggest thing. And then I guess the big pitfall is you're playing a game and games aren't education. And I should put that in air quotes, right? <laughs> um, and so it, it's always a delicate balance. And I know sometimes when I first started doing this, sometimes I would have to, I was always very prepared to say, if it came down to it, to tell a parent, Yes, we played a game, but this is why we're playing the game. This is what the actual purpose is and making sure that the students know why we're doing it. It's not just because Mr. Brown doesn't want to teach today. There's actually a right. purpose behind it and being there prepared to if someone from the home office comes into class that day and sees this or what is going on. So being able to combat that potential misconception that you're just playing games, like you're just, oh, you didn't want to teach, you're showing a movie today. So to kind of battling that and making sure that the kids are locking into what they're actually learning here and they don't just get lost in playing a game. So I think those for me are the biggest challenges. Yeah. Yeah. You make a really good point is about framing students for understanding why. And then also on the back end or even throughout the game debriefing, I guess on the back end, that would be debriefing on what you learned. But throughout the game, you can kind of have some stopping points where you're kind of requiring them to uh, show what they're learning or show what they're doing that is the process of maybe what you're teaching in class too. Awesome. So you mentioned you had a project, I think Million Year Vampire. <laughs> so this came out in to me in the summer and or maybe last spring. I'd, I'd tangentially heard of it. It's a single, it's a solo role-playing game called The Thousand-Year-Old yeah. Vampire. And I want to say the designer is Tim Hutchings. I believe that's it. And, uh, uh, well, hopefully f future Dustin can correct that in post <laughs> if, that, if, I, if I got that wrong. And it, it got a bit, of uh, a bit of press on Shut Up and Sit Down. They actually did a video review on it. And that's not my personally my kind of game. It's a role-playing game. It's, a, it's really a creative writing game game is what it is you're creating this diary of this vampire who lives for a thousand years and kind of the conceit of the game part is you have certain skills that you have and sometimes the you get a new prompt and it says use a skill to solve this problem which is what's guiding your mm. um your, your narrative so right. if i have the skill sword fighting lying and baking and it says here's a problem dustin's angry at you solve it well, depending on which skill I choose to use is going to be a very different entry of how I <laughs> solve it. You know, clearly I'm going to bake you a cake and I'm going to lie about it at the same time. Um, and so that that's kind of the conceit of the game. The other conceit of the game is the mortal memory is finite. And as you go through, you record these memories and experiences, but you can only keep five. Mm. And so you literally, if you have five and it says record a memory, you have to forget part of your existence and then you can never use that moving forward in your, your diary. And sometimes someone might come back into the story that you've forgotten about. And so again, that will change your, it's going to inform your story. So that's the kind of the, the core of this. And it has, I don't know, a hundred different entries and a bunch of different endings and so on. And each time you, you roll a die and that, jumps you forward X number of entries into the, into the story. So someone had told me about it and I, you know, I wasn't interested about it, but I got to thinking over the summer because I I'd really been enjoying doing games with the kids. And I thought, well, what if, what if I use this with the students? Could I do that? How can I make that work? 
So the first thing I did was I reached out to the designer and said, hey, I'd like to use this, but I need to change it because I can't do something where all these kids are vampires because of the inherent violence and darkness that goes along with that and presenting that to the kids. So I need to change it a little bit and I would need, and I can buy a copy of the game, but I can't buy 50 copies of the game. So are you okay with me buying one and then making copies of stuff and using that? Is that okay with you? Because I don't want to take advantage of this guy's work. And he got right. back and said, no, no, absolutely do it. You know, here, have a copy. Don't even buy it. Here, take it, do it. <laughs> That's awesome. And what we wound up doing was I made it to where I called it the immortal student. And the very first day I checked with the history teacher and I said, well, where do you start the year? Ancient Greece. Great. And the very first thing was the students, their first entry was you are living in ancient Greece. And some students said, well, do we have to be Greek? I was like, can, can we be Chinese? Cause I have a, I was like, sure, but go do the research. Because you're starting history in ancient Greece. So what would be the situation if someone from China or India or wherever was in ancient Greece? Like, what? how right. could they be there? Yeah, that's and, awesome. you know, you use your imagination. It doesn't tr matter fully to me, but, you know, figure that out. And then how did you become immortal? Whatever you want. And so, some kids got bitten by something. Some drank from a fountain. Some were fighting a monster that bled on that, like all kinds of wacky stuff. And so it already it ignited this imagination. They're starting to tell a story. Great fun. And then throughout the year, I think we wound up doing 17 different entries throughout the school year. So about every other week we would do one. I would check in with history every now and then. And anytime they moved forward in history to a new era, we moved forward through history with the immortal student. So they're being interested. Okay, guys. You just went from ancient Greece to, I can't remember where they went to next, but it was, you know, 600 years they jumped. I said, okay, so what does that mean for all these people that you know? Well, they're all dead. That's sad. I'm like, well, hey, I didn't make history, right? But now you have to start thinking about that and putting that into their story. And so they're advancing on through this story. And I think the sixth graders, they lived, I don't know, 5,000 years, you know, forever. <laughs> but they're bringing in stuff from history and they're in these different eras, and so they're taking then they're then they're having to describe what the world was like in these different eras that they're learning about in history. And then at the same time, we're learning about plot structure and the story of a plot. And then they've had to take their whole story English-wise. And as we got to the end of the year, I said, okay, guys, if you haven't gotten to your climax yet of this the life history, then you need to get there. Because we only have this many entries left because then you're going to have to have their falling action, the resolution and their epilogue and all these things. So they're having to keep that in their head, the story structure. And what the great thing about the story is or the game is it has fun prompts. And I would take them that would let them get some dice and they'd roll some dice. And said, OK, this class, you're moving ahead three. All right. Group A. And sometimes it would be lovely and nice. You you uh, there's one I can think of when they're still in ancient Greece that, you find a lost child and you befriend them. What do you do together? Oh. Where do you go? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. There was another one where there was in Athens, there was a plague at some point. So we're talking about, you know, this happens, what's going on, how did it start? Some kids like, yeah, I started it. I started the plague. <laughs> <laughs> so like, wow, you're a monster. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> and so as we got that's to clever, the end, though. Cool. yeah, but they were excited about it, which is kind of the, the core of it is at the end of the year, now that they've just finished, they're turning it in on Wednesday. Um, some of them wrote 70, 80 pages of story. And they were excited about it. Every time we would do a new entry, they would get excited. And they'd roll, they'd roll the dice and I'd go, oh, God, oh, that's bad. Oh, guys, I can't. That's bad. I can't believe you did that. And they get all worried and excited and all these things that are happening and mostly it's history and most, but it's a lot of their own story and their imagination that they're bringing in. And there's a supernatural that comes in from the game itself. And they have all of this agency within this story that they're writing, but the parameters of the game guided them. Mm. And they had, because it's, you know, if I just said you're going to write an entry in your diary, 
they some wouldn't do it, nor they wouldn't know what to do. And the other thing that I used for my class is I turned it into their grammar tests. So every so often for an entry, I would say, okay, this one's a test, guys. Hmm. And your entry must include four verbal phrases and five subordinate clauses or whatever it was that we'd been learning about. And then boom, they're all there. So now they're showing that one, they can write a story. Two, they can take these things we've learned and use them and identify them. And they're mostly having fun while they're doing it because they get to tell whatever story that they want to do. There was one student who really doesn't write much. It's just through the years, he when he has to write something, he, does, he writes as little as possible. Mm. And the first one of these tests that we had, I, I'm not messing around. He wrote seven and a half pages <laughs> about skeletons in his story. And... You know, he, he did he did did you know pretty well in the thing, but he wrote seven and a half pages. And now the, all the, every single kid has a book that they have written at the end of the year and they're excited about. And the whole I kept thinking I was gonna stop, but every time they would get so excited about doing it, and we finally got to the end, and the end has and the thousand year old vampire has, I think, two quote unquote good endings. And maybe four mm. not so good endings because it's thousand year old, so it's finite. Yeah. And yeah. watching the students as they randomly wound up with whatever it is that they have and what's going to happen, and the ones like one of them was they were imprisoned and you're now stuck in prison somewhere. What do you do for the next thousand years? Is is the problem? <laughs> Like by yourself that way, what are you going to do? And then immediately, well, but, no, but Mr. Brown, can we, can, is there, can we escape? Can we, is there a way we can escape? Cause I don't want this to happen. I was like, Hey, the entry says a thousand years. You can tell me what happens to the epilogue, but they were so invested. And the last thing I'll say about it, which was just so funny somewhere in the middle, one group. So there's four different groups in the two classes. One group found some magic relic that it said, if you still have this, at the end of the game, you can choose your ending. And the last entry, they rolled their dice and they started losing stuff. So you have to lose your oldest item that you have. And then this happens, you have to give away this other item. And then you decide that material things are stupid. So throw away your third oldest item. And all but two of them right before the end threw away this thing that was let them choose their future. And they were just so devastated and crestfallen, but laughing about it in a way that I don't see in anything else I teach. And that was like a 20 minute exposition about what we did. Um, yeah. But it's, oh, it, no. it, it was, it was great. And I'm absolutely going to do it again. And I'm going to try to present it to the English department as something. This might be worth checking out. Because if nothing yeah. else, they wrote 70 pages of stuff, which for a sixth grader is big. Yeah, no, I've got I've got a few notes here. Um, one, this is the one that I share with everyone, and it's play more games. Because that's you mentioned, it's not really your game, your style of game, but you had heard about it, you checked it out, and you're like, this would be perfect for my classroom, perfect to use in class. And if you hadn't played some other games that you don't normally play, you would have never stumbled upon that. So that's, I mean, that's super awesome. Um, and then also, I love how the, so I just recorded an episode not too long ago. I think it will probably be out before this episode with you, with Jenny. And we talked about game-based learning and gamification. And it's not the topic of the episode. We kind of got into that conversation about the differences. And I think you have a really unique thing and it, it makes my brain hurt sometimes trying to, distinguish the difference between them but i think you have a unique thing where it is game-based learning because they're going through the process of learning about plot and they're learning about how a character develops throughout a story and climax and all that great stuff and then also you're using it to i would say maybe use it to gamify their grammar tests kind of in a way too i don't know if you would call that oh, game -based gamification I mean, and I then, absolutely did gamify the, the grammar test because in years past, it's, uh, it's you know, circle the subordinate clause in the sentence and they, they, they don't care. 
They just want to get it done as fast as they can. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's arguable if they still care, but mm. they were at least engaged to it because they had to use this thing to support this story that they're writing that they really cared about. Right. Uh, and something else I, I should have thought about. I, I sent the designer an email because I asked all the students, said, okay, what is the coolest thing your immortal has done? And what is the worst thing? That they've done and it's funny because a lot of them it was the same thing the one was like i punched the emperor of china for both I was like, oh my gosh and some the, the kid i caused a plague that killed all of athens and, oh, but another one the worst thing that she did was i lied to my mother and told her i wasn't a mortal and so seeing the spread of things that these students are coming up with and like what they think is amazing what they think was horrible and then being able to talk about it has just made for a whole bunch of uh, exciting things and I think, and you know, we, we shall see how it goes next year, but I would argue that my students this year learned the grammar and uh, structure of writing better than any of them have in the past. Now, I'm not saying that they're all brilliant at it, but I think the overall quality of their writing and structure is better if for no other reason than they wrote all these pages. And to be fair... I haven't read every single page of all of this. The, anybody teaching out there, you don't have to grade everything. <laughs> yeah. Let me just say, because, you know, that's 50 <laughs> kids, 70 pages each, right? You know, yeah, that's yeah. you do that. But so, but as I go through and as I read them, you can see the difference. And then, of course, some of them are going back and fixing early stuff, mm. which, yeah. again, I'm not telling them to do, but because they want it to be that good. Yeah, that was that was another point I wrote down. There's that huge intrinsic motivation to want to write and do well with their writing and understanding plot and understanding how a character fits within a story and that kind of dynamic character that they develop too. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, I was I had another point or another question. Oh, maybe so. I'm going to give a tip and then you can maybe offer some other tips to teachers. So one thing that you did that I also did with Sherlock Holmes consulting detective is I took that theme, I took that game and I built my course, my semester around that uh, Sherlock Holmes con consulting detective was like the overall theme for everything we did in class. Like I was flipping my classroom. So Google classroom was called London. Um, we got into detective groups and they worked in detective groups throughout the semester to solve the puzzle in the game. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'll leave some links maybe below because I do want to make a video about how I did that. But maybe you can share some tips to teachers on how they could get started or some things that helped you in your process. Yeah, I think the biggest, this is so cheesy, but the biggest thing is just do it. I mean, I I didn't, you know, I didn't ask permission to do this thing. Right. I just did it, and you know, credit to my administration, you know, where it's due, they they were fine with it. Just mm. you know, what what is this thing? That sounds strange. Oh well, whatever. They're happy and they're learning. Great. But just kind of jumping in, and the but more in depth, I think the key is, and you just alluded to it, is you have to make sure you adapt it to your community and your culture that you are in. So for me, I knew if I presented that you were all vampires, i.e. blood drinkers, there's going to be pushback. Some yeah. kids are going to want, just not want to do it. And some parents will certainly be upset by it. So it's a matter of, I took, I said, okay, you are now in charge of your own narrative here. And I would remind them, say, okay, keep in mind, uh, the principal may read this, your parents may mm. read this, so make sure you're, you're going down that yeah. way. And so you had kids who were arguably worse than an evil vampire. You know, the <laughs> one who was thrilled that he unleashed a plague on Athens. Um, and I think the end of his story was he did something and eliminated life on Earth, I think <laughs> is how he ended. So I don't, you know, but that was where he was going with it and where he wanted to take it. Whereas the other one, as I said, the worst thing that she had done was lied to her mother. Mm. And, and so that was solely based around, I was like, okay, I know my parent and student community. 
how can we do this in a way to make sure everyone is happy with this? And so it took a little bit of you know, reading ahead in the, the game book because I didn't, uh, I had to change every single entry. Every one, I had to change it based on what they're doing. So some, again, it even says at the beginning of the Thousand Year Old Vampire book that some of this is very dark. And so you're taking those and changing it. So it is less dark and violent and it's more ambiguous. And in some cases, I just said, oh, nope, you're gonna have to reroll, guys. I, that, this is too dark. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about how dark this is. Roll again. Um, but if you're teaching a course to seniors in high school or something, or you're teaching a junior college course or something like that, maybe that's okay. And you can mm -hmm. go down that path. So I think that that's the biggest thing. And then the other thing I'll say is also, and this is going to sound weird, but remember it's a game. Like it still should be fun because if they're having fun, they're going to want to do it. And if they want to do it, they're going to put more effort into it. I think those are my two and a half tips. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we're going to move into the game, but do you have any like last words? I know you shared a bunch of great tips or final words of advice. Anything else that we want to chat about or any other like parting words about this topic? Um, not so much other than it occurs to me that I still also let them just play games for fun sometimes. You know, yeah. I, I think that's the other side of it is, you know, don't take it and go so deep into the education portion of it that you risk it becoming an assignment for the students and always trying to keep that fun into it, uh, I, th I think is key, which is why, like I said, I, I didn't, I don't read all the entries and sometimes they just write one and say, okay, guys, you're advancing your story, go mm. do a thing. And we played just one just for fun, or we haven't this year played two rooms in a boom because of COVID, but yeah, just playing those kinds of things to kind of broaden their horizons and get them excited about all these games and stuff. And I also will say more, I haven't had a single complaint from a single parent in the three years I've been using games in the classroom and a bunch of students have suddenly gone out and convinced their parents to buy games so they can play them together. And I don't, I mean, uh, I'm not a parent. Are, are you, do you have a uh, kidney kids? No, no. Okay. But I don't know a single parent that is upset if their child says, can we sit down and play a game together? Yeah, right. I, right. I just don't know of that happening. And so I, I think that has really been a, a boon for some families all around. And I totally forgot the other thing that I've done is the kids all have an option to make a board game for their final project on The oh, Hobbit. Cool. Okay. They don't have to. The rule is, okay, guys. There's two rules for this. One, it, I mean, I explained what this means, but it can't just be shoots and ladders. It's not rolling mm -hmm. a die and moving. You have to come up with some kind of other mechanic that does something and, you know, I'll help you, whatever. And someone who's never read The Hobbit has to be able to play this game fully. And they would now know the story of The Hobbit and be able to answer questions about it. Like that. That's the whole thing. And they don't have yeah. to do it. They have seven different options. But an amazing number of them do want to do it by the end of the year. And they, they really do get their brains going and figuring stuff out. And truth be told, the games are not good in the sense of I'm going to keep playing them because anyone who's if you ever talk to a board game designer, it takes years of playtesting and re refining and developing. But right. the ideas are good and they've made something they're proud of. I even had one student once use a company called The Game Crafter and oh, wow. actually have his game made. He said, is there a way you can do that? Well, there is. Here's a website, but it's expensive. He said, no, 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 we're going to do it. And he had a board made and a box made. And apparently That's all cool. the, he had something like 300 cards he wanted to have made. And <laughs> that he got his, his parents. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, That's like expensive. $80 for cards. Hold up. But he made them all by hand. Okay. Yeah. And he still has it. He's uh, this two awesome. years ago. He did it. I actually was able to get him to bring it in so I could show it to the kids. And it's just That's this cool. idea of game is always exciting to the kids. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's awesome. I love the, the idea of using games in your class to, well, one, I, I think that a lot of teachers experienced that this year during the pandemic is that's one thing a lot of teachers leaned into as an easy way to kind of build relationships virtually. Um, but I love how you're already kind of doing it in your class and 
then as the final project, they can create a game. So they're using their uh, what they learned in class to show you through that creation. And you've introduced some games to them already. So they kind of have that in the back of their head is like, OK, this is kind of what it could do at the end. Um, yeah, that's super cool. All right. So speaking of games, because that's all we talk about, we're going to play a game. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to send you the link, I think. So we're going to play Wavelength. And in Wavelength, I have a scale. So I'll grab the box here. This is Wavelength, so it's upside down. Um, it is a party game. And hopefully, by the time this episode is out, we'll have it at Board Games Education, trying to get some copies in. Um, but essentially, you get a scale of where you have to guess clues. So you might have something like unhygienic on one side to hygienic on the other. I'll look at where I want you to guess. So it could be like zero to a hundred and then I'll turn it to you and you might say, I might give you a clue like, uh, who's the guy from, from Charlie Brown? Pigpen. Uh, is it Pigpen? Yeah. Yeah. He, he always has a, the dust cloud following. Him. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be my clue. And then you would guess, okay, is Pigpen like super hygienic or is he pretty unhygienic? And you might, you might go right there. And I would reveal, oh, that's it's backwards. <laughs> so hopefully you would go unhygienic, and that's over there, I think. Boy, I, I, th I think you need to look up that word, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we're going to play on the web. So there's a web version of the game called longwave.web.app, and it's a limited version where they don't have as many clues as Wavelength, the actual game. So um, it's something that you can use to try out the game and see if you like it. Um, and we're going to use it here. I'm not going to reveal my screen to you just yet because of my clues on here and I don't want you to know. But the two okay. clues are unreasonable phobias on one end and on the other end is reasonable phobia. All right. Yeah, um, I, can, I can see that. Oh, yeah, you can see it. I guess uh, maybe to anyone listening. Um, so we'll go with uh, my clue will be... Uh, Books. Bo <laughs> Books. <laughs> so you'll drag the thing on. I'm going to now share my screen. Oh, I made you small. That's not what I want to do. I want to share my screen so we can see what William's thinking. So you could guess that it's all the way on one end, unreasonable, or all the way on another end, reasonable. Um, and my clues books. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't want to judge people's lives. So I'm sure <laughs> there are people that have a legitimate reason to be terrified of books, but I, boy, for the life of me, I can't think of any. So I'm putting it way over towards unreasonable. Ooh, Ooh. that's pretty good. Just missed it. Yeah. So that would score you in the game. You get more points how closer you are. So you get three points there. I'm not sure how they compare the app to the actual game, but we're also playing as a team. So we're just going to do like maybe four rounds. So I think it should be giving you a scale and you can determine a clue if you don't ah, mind. Yep. Okay. So yeah, we have so easy subject have... and hard subject. All right. And so I'm going to. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, oh, I see. And it gives me the target I have to get to. I see. Right. So I don't pick the target. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. All right. I'm going to say. Physical education. All right. So easy subject, hard subject, physical education. And, and, I, and I'm thinking about, uh, about about who's guessing is what I'm doing here. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm. Which is what, actually kind of neat. That's one of the neat things about this game is that it yeah. really is a bit about who who is doing the guessing. Because I know right. I know about your ultra marathons and stuff. <laughs> okay. Now I kind of know where to put my clue. Um, yeah, just as a side, any Nebraska football players out there, this was, we had a chance to do like famous person, infamous person, infamous, or like non famous, I guess yep. popular, not popular, I think was the clue. And I used a coach from Nebraska football because I knew there was one person playing that knew Nebraska football very well and knew that it was a popular coach where everyone else had no idea who I was talking about. Um, so it was kind of cool that they kind of deduced that to guess the clue. Um, but I was going to go really high because I was thinking physical is like something that you can actually touch, which is something hard. And I was thinking maybe you're kind of helping me that way, but we'll go. Oh, yeah. No, I, I was thinking PE. Yeah. So close. So close. All right. 
We'll do two more rounds. Oh no, I don't want you to see. Can you see my screen? No, no, I know. Okay, cool. I'm just on the uh, uh, other screen. All right, I, so uh, I have easy to kill, hard to kill. And my clue is going to be, um, I don't know. Man, let's say, uh, say, uh, uh, I don't know if this is a good clue, but we're going to go with germs. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I feel like oh. the hardest ones for these have to be like in the middle. Like if your target's yeah. right in the middle, but germs. See, now that this is tough because we've, we've been locked away for 18 months because we can't kill this germ. <laughs> but hand sanitizer does kill 99 point whatever percent. So I'm going to go with this. Oh my gosh. Where I don't we? know if I liked my clue after I gave it, but I kind of just, <laughs> I just gave it. It was, it was pretty. So anyone that's listening is very, very close to the end on easy to kill was my clue. All right. All right. Let's see if we can bring it back. So boring hobby or interesting hobby. Wow. Yeah, this is very judgmental game sometimes, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious how many people I'm about to offend here by putting <laughs> knitting. Knitting. OK, so uh, boring hobby is all the way on the left. Interesting hobby all the way on the right. I'm going to go pretty far on the left, maybe about one eighth of the way. I just want all you knitting fans to know that I appreciate you far more <laughs> than Dustin does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So that is Wavelength. Boy, um, we started so well. Yeah, we did do really well. And then we kind of we kind of blew it towards just the jumped end. Jumped right off the cliff. Yeah. Awesome, William. Thank you again for coming on the Board Game with Education video cast. If anyone wants to reach out to you, where might they do that? Or what are you working on? Uh, so the easiest way is if you are on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you can just search Hungry Gamer and it's a kind of a cartoonish type picture of me eating a box. It says Hungry Gamer, pretty hard to miss. Or if you just want to get reach out to me directly, talk about Thousand Year Old Vampire, that uh, the immortal student, as I call it, something like that. You can just uh, reach me at hungryreviews at gmail.com. Happy to talk about those things. And also, I am getting this game for my students next year because that will work. That'll be a hit. Wavelength? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, That's it's be a hit. perfect for advisory period. Like you have a couple minutes. You just need something to do while you're waiting for, I don't know, to line up for an event or whatever you need to do. You have a few minutes. You know, you have a few minutes in your class all the time. And you're trying to think of something to do. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, just kind of my my only little words of wisdom is... Um, just play some games. Like even it doesn't have to be for your classroom. Find something that you are enjoying mm -hmm. because I never thought about it in the classroom until I, well, anyone watching, I got a bazillion games behind me um, until I started playing games on my own. And also really when you do bring it into the classroom, if you do bring it into the classroom, don't, settle for the first one that they really like keep mixing it up because mm -hmm. i they love dr esker's notebook when i bring that one in and then when i say okay we're gonna do something different oh mr yeah. brown and then they love two rooms <laughs> and a boom and if you are excited about it they will get excited about it i mean some won't but that's the way all of it goes so yeah. I, I think that that's my only my only advice about it. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Play play more games, definitely. Even video games, even just any any mobile games, anything helps. It helps you brainstorm. Yeah, there's several uh, digital apps that the kids love that they've been doing over Zoom and that they mm -hmm. arrange themselves. There's one called Scribble.io. Oh, yeah. There's a, basically, um, it's, it's like a Pictionary type thing or a Telestrations type, type game, but it's all web-based and they, they love it. I absolutely love it. Um, right. Awesome. So, William, thank you again. I know I learned a lot. I know I'm going to kind of look into that idea of this game, too. I might contact the designer, see if we can put it in our shop, too. Uh, I don't know who the publisher would be if it's self-published, but... Um, yeah, yeah he, he has it uh, um, available 
um, he has, he has a website and you can purchase it as a, you can purchase hard copy books or uh, the PDF. Okay. Um, but I, I, oh, perfect. I suspect he'd be happy to, I don't know, set up some kind of something. Um, I mean, he'd probably just give it away. I, I almost tell him to stop it. No, let me pay you. Um, but he <laughs> seems to be very, very passionate about just getting it out there and helping the community. Um, yeah. And I think it's back in stock. It, it, I, my understanding is it pretty much went right out of stock when shut up and sit down and talked about it. Oh, jeez, yeah. yeah. I'm sure. So if anyone's not familiar, shut up and sit down is like a huge board game review. Yeah, their YouTube Content channel creators. has the most subscribers of any board game related YouTube channel out there, which is not a lot, you know, it's 300,000. Mm -hmm. So you compare that to, you know, a Justin Bieber or whatever. Yeah, it's nothing, but yeah. just to kind of put that in in, in the perspective, um, right? But awesome. So thank you again, William, and hopefully we'll chat again soon. Yeah, thank you so much, and keep listening to his shows, everybody. Thanks. All right, thank you for checking out this week's episode. This was our last planned episode for season twelve. We'll go into season thirteen after we have two more episodes coming up that are or were not planned. I always like to do some solo episodes at the end of a season and I have some really special episodes coming up. One that I will talk about now, I'm gonna talk about some games I used in the classroom this past summer for in-person teaching and how I did those games at a distance. So I'm just gonna have a chat and share some of those games that I uh, used in my classroom the last, uh, I taught a two week enrichment program for um, high school students, so I'll talk about how I use those games in the classroom this past two weeks, and actually I'm recording this now, I have two more weeks of classes coming up, a new set of students, so actually I'll have a little bit more information to share about that as well. And then I wanna do one more solo episode before we round off the season, and I'll talk more about that and what that episode topic's gonna be next week. Uh, but as always, thank you for checking out the channel. Again, go to boardgamewitheducation.com, check out our web store, you can always sign up for our newsletter. That's the best way to keep up to date with us. I share anything we're doing, whether it's on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, wherever wherever we're doing stuff, I share that, as well as other online resources we find helpful for you that you may find useful for your learning environment or other great things going on in the board game industry or in education. And finally, we also include some promotions in that newsletter too. So you can find that at boardgamewitheducation.com. You'll have to scroll down a little bit, but it's about a quarter of the way down the page. Or you can go to boardgamewitheducation.com backslash podcast dash community. I'll leave those links below too. All right, so we'll see you next week.